Good evening. Thank you for joining us for our virtual community meetings. Community meeting. This meeting is about the 2022 school levies. I'm your host, Tina Christensen, and I'm a communications consultant with the Capital Projects and Planning Department. Next slide, please. Jen, next slide. You should have it. There's a delay, I think. Yeah, I think you're delayed, Tina. Okay. Before we get started, there here's some basic information. I want to highlight a few points. The meeting is being recorded so we can post it next week. We will treat you with respect and expect you to do the same. As we go along, you can put questions in the chat. We may be able to answer some of them during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll include them in the question and answer session. The meeting will end at 730. If you have additional questions and comments after that, we will take them through the online feedback form. Next slide. Here's a quick review of our agenda. We'll have the presentation and then we'll move into questions and answers. Now I will hand the Now I will hand the session over to Jolyn Berge, the Chief Financial Officer for Seattle Public Schools. Thank you, Tina. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you could join us this evening. So as we move on to slide four, um, we'll talk a little bit about K-12 uh, funding. Both in Seattle, but in all districts across Washington State, school districts are funded with state, local, and federal dollars, and typically we all are about the same. So we'll show you a slide in just a minute that kind of breaks that down. So we're all similar in percentages that we receive through the state um, and from local dollars, which are our levy dollars. And then all of all districts ask voters every three years or so to renew an operations levy, which is a local education property tax. Um, then local levies, just as a reminder why this is important to Seattle, local levies for Seattle are the main source of funding for technology. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. And it's our source of funding for all of our school building construction and improvement um, projects as well. Uh, all of the money generated in Seattle, unlike state property taxes, all of the local voter approved levies do stay in Seattle public schools and support our students and schools. Next slide. So this slide shows really just how important our local levies are um, to our funding overall. So in Seattle, we have about a $1.2 billion budget. The state is providing about 60% of the revenue and that's generated through enrollment. And then local property taxes are the next biggest source of income for our school district at 15%. And you can see after that, we're at federal dollars um, at about 12%. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, SPS levies. So our levies have to be approved by our voters. We have two levies every three years that come up for renewal. So every three years we ask for the voters to renew our operations levy. They do cover some things not funded by the state and we'll go over those in just a moment. And then the other levy, we um, run offset. So once every three years, we'll have some type of, of capital levy uh, in February, upcoming in February of 2022, we're going to have the BTA levy or BTA five. And then three years after that, we would have BEX. So they alternate. The capital levies alternate. The operating levies are every three years. And then renewing the levies, um, we'll talk about how important those are for our students, schools, and our staff. On the next slide, we just give a little bit of information about how our tax rates compare to other districts. So for every $1,000 of assessed valuation, in uh, 2021, this gives you an idea of what other school districts were charging um, their property tax rates for their local levies to their citizens. And as you can see in Seattle, we're lucky to be the lowest. Uh, we have a total combined rate of $1.84. 
and that rate is, if, if not one of the lowest in the in the state, um, I would be surprised. So it's it's a it's a low rate. We have a lot of assessed valuation in uh, business assessed valuation in our school district boundaries, and so it does create um, a rate that is more favorable than other districts. On the next slide. Uh, we'll talk now specifically about the education programs and operations levy, and this is a renewal. So we call this levy the operations levy. Sometimes we call it the EP&O renewal. Um, on the next slide, it does show that it is every three years. So we've talked about that a little bit. And then um, on, as we move on to the next slide, it really does bridge the gap between what the state is providing and what the district is needing um, to fund. And we've provided some examples of some things that the levy is funding for Seattle. Each district uh, across our state probably has some of these areas in common, and then maybe we have some differences. So we do pay for um, child nutrition programs, our school lunch programs. We do um, fund teacher pay and some additional counselors. And then as you can see on the next slide, we have some more examples of just things that you may or may not be aware, aware of. If you've joined us in a presentation for budget or levy in the past, these may look familiar to you. But if you're new to us, you may be surprised to know that the state for our 50,000 students funds us nine nurses, and we buy that up out of our levy and out of some other grant dollars, and we have a total of 68 nurses. But if you ask our schools what they need, they're going to tell you that we really need 104 nurses. So we're not all the way there yet, but our levy dollars really significantly impact the amount of nurses that we can deploy to our schools. On the next slide, we talk about another area where the state funds um, differently than what our needs are. So we, the state is funding 219 custodians, and we have more than 3,200 classrooms we employ 408 custodians. So another example of where local levy dollars fill in between the difference between what the state, and they call it the prototypical funding model, and they say a school that's average size of X generates these numbers. Um, and then they put that number, that number increases or decreases depending on your enrollment. So these are not unique situations for Seattle. All school districts are underfunded in nurses. All school districts are underfunded in custodians. Next slide. Um, another big area that's very common, uh, that there is a significant disconnect, um, and these used levy dollars are used by many districts across the state, is in the area of special education. So we have more than 7,600 special education students, and the state is currently funding us at about $82 million and we're spending over $180 million um, in our current budget for our special education program. So these costs are something that the levy is instrumental in allowing us to maintain um, the program of service that we have for special education. Not just allowing us to maintain, but special education services are also required by the federal government. Um, we're not gonna talk about the funding gap at the federal level today, but let's just say there's one that exists there as well. Moving on to the next slide. Talk a little bit about our financial summary. So the levy that is being uh, proposed, and these are recommended numbers to the school board. They have yet to take action, but these are our recommendations. The levy amount would be $646 million over three years. And we are um, capped by uh, the state. So the state changed how much school districts could ask for and levy. Uh, frankly, oftentimes Seattle has been had very generous taxpayers and, and while our, our taxpayers may want to provide more than $3,000 per student, which is the state limit, we are limited by law on what we can collect. So uh, the proposed rate for the February 2022 election is 74 cents per thousand of assessed valuation. And I will just say that we're the state law right now, what we could collect is 63 cents per thousand. 
we do put some um, margin for error in there. So we have contingency amounts built in, increase in case our enrollment increases. If our enrollment increases by another 100 students, then we could collect those additional dollars. What the voters have to approve is a total dollar amount. And so we have we built in like all districts across the state. We build in capacity for enrollment increases and we have some capacity built in for legislative changes. So often, at least in my tenure here and when I was at the state, um, the legislature does change the rules on levies and the funding model at times. And so instead of having to go back out to our voters and ask for increased approval, most districts and including Seattle will ask for an amount that has capacity to allow for changes in the law or enrollment changes. But at the end of the day, we only are allowed to collect um, what the state law allows and what our enrollment actually is. Next slide. All right, and actually next I'm going to pass it off to Richard Best, who is our director of um, capital. Richard. Thank you, Jolyn. So I'm Richard Best, as Jolyn indicated, I'm director of capital projects and planning for Seattle Public Schools. I have had this position since 2014 and uh, pleased to have the opportunity tonight to talk with you about our BTA 5 capital levy. Uh, next slide, please. So give you a little bit of facilities and background information. Um, Seattle Public Schools has 104 schools. Uh, they range in age from 1889, which is BF Day Elementary School, to our newest school that we brought online in um, 2021, which is Wing Luke Elementary School. Um, approximately 40 of our schools are landmarked by the City of Seattle Department of Neighborhoods Landmark Preservation Board, and we have about 10 million um, square feet. Um, from an asset value standpoint, that's approximately um, $7.5 billion. And we come um, to the voters asking for um, capital uh, facility support um, every three years. Uh, we we have a, a three year, uh, excuse me, our levies are six years in duration, and we come before the voters every three years. We have the BEX levy, which stands for Building Excellence Levy, which um, I like to compare them to the um, Summer and Winter Olympic Olympics. The BEX levy would be are larger of the two levies and generally deals with um, building modernizations and replacements. And then our BTA levies um, generally deal with systems repairs and replacements. Uh, to characterize the systems repairs, we're talking about um, roof replacements, window replacements, HVAC um, upgrades, boiler replacements, electrical service upgrades, uh, those are all considered um, systems type replacements. In both our BECs and BTA levies, there's also a, a funding element for technology. And uh, Carlos Del Valle, who is our, our executive director of the Department of Technology Services, will be speaking about that a little later. Um, and then um, we also have money um, set aside for our academics and athletic projects. And so, those are the elements that are within a BTA levy. Next slide, please. Um, in developing a, a proposed project list for the BTA levy, I will note that we do utilize third party consultants once every six years. Um, we have a consultant do a facilities assessment of our 104 schools, and they literally assess the building from the ground up, looking at the um, condition of the concrete foundation, looking at the condition of the structural systems, looking at the condition of the building envelope, the roof, the mechanical systems within the building, be that uh, plumbing or HVAC, and then the various electrical systems, including, you know, obviously electrical distribution, but also intercom, fire alarm, security systems, and then also the condition of our data systems. 
Um, from this information, um, we develop a project list and, and then from the project list, we go out and use a third party cost estimator to tell us what it will cost to either repair or replace uh, those ex uh, existing systems. Um, we do, um, in the development of our project list, look at the board's uh, guiding policies and guiding principles. And then we also try to um, look at our projects through an equity lens. I'll note that our, le our levies do have public scrutiny uh, through a BECS and BTA oversight committee. Um, and we are required to make a monthly presentation of the different components within our levies and the status to this public oversight committee. Um, it's made up of 11 members of the public and then two school board members. And so um, in, in the BTA 5 capital levy, we will be recommending um, priority one projects be implemented. So next slide, please. So one of the significant um, uh, projects on our BTA 5 um, capital levy is the replacement of Memorial Stadium. And when we're talking about the replacement of Memorial Stadium, I want to be clear that we're talking about the replacement of the grandstands, replacement of the synthetic turf, and then also the replacement of the existing lighting. The existing lighting is metal halide, and we will be replacing that with LED lighting LED lighting gives you much better control and does um, uh, minimize light glow. And um, and so that's a um, improvement we'll be making at the stadium. I also think it's important to note that we have set aside a, um, uh, a small amount of um, funding to um, bring back the Memorial Stadium wall. Um, um, at at, uh, at Memorial Stadium, we'll not be demolishing that, we'll not be replacing that, we're planning on preserving that and uh, bringing it back similar to its existing condition uh, when it was um, first built. So next slides, please. Um, part of the proposed building systems and improvements, obviously we have uh, site improvements, which will be um, as noted on the slide here, we'll be making asphalt repairs and replacements. We'll be improving our stormwater systems, um, trying to retain more stormwater on site. In addition, we will be um, upgrading our playgrounds at several schools and installing safety surfaces. Uh, with the playground upgrades, we'll also be making them, making sure that we comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, next slide. Um, in addition, um, thermal comfort is incredibly important um, for our uh, uh, staff and students. And so we have plans in BTA 5 to replace um, at numerous schools our single pane windows. Uh, we'll be replacing them with operable windows, um, but we're looking at um, trying to use a, a a two pane um, window system and then upgrading um, uh, many of our exterior doors as well. Um, our roofs, uh, we're looking at replacing some roofs and then also making some masonry repairs um, based upon the um, third party assessment of our um, facilities. Next slide. Um, in addition, um, safety and security is another area that we focus on. We we want to make sure that um, our buildings are structurally sound in the event of a seismic uh, event. And so we have had structural engineers um, do an assessment of our buildings and identify some um, seismic improvements. I will note that the BEX4 um, capital levy did implement seismic improvements at 54 schools. Um, Again, we have 104 schools, and so we're continuing to implement um, seismic improvements at, at other buildings as well as part of our BTA 5 capital levy ask. In addition, we're looking at um, upgrading our fire, some of our older fire alarm systems, um, installing fire suppression systems, that's what um, fire sprinklers are, and then looking at also uh, making some security improvements. Next slide. Um, 
In addition to the safety and security improvements, we're also looking at upgrading our mechanical and electrical systems, uh, HVAC. Um, we've identified several schools for HVAC improvements, plumbing improvements, electrical service. Um, most of you are familiar probably that the school district has gone to one to one ratio in the distribution of technology. And so that has um, strained some of our older buildings electrical uh, services. And so we're looking at upgrading some of those electrical services at our older facilities. We're also looking at um, improving um, lighting and, and installing LED lighting at some of our older schools as well. And then upgrading some intercom systems. Next slide. And lastly, uh, we will be um, continuing to implement improvements throughout the district in creating secure entry vestibules based upon um, a SEPTED principles uh, in which you are able to enter into the building, but then you are forced into the office before you get access uh, into um, the uh, main building. Many of our BEX4 schools, BTA4 schools, and the first wave of our BEX5 schools all have these secure entry vestibules. Um, ADA improvements are part of um, the uh, BTA5 uh, levy as well. Um, implementation of gender neutral restrooms, clean energy improvements, and then upgrades to the district's central kitchen, um, which uh, serves all of our elementary schools and K-8 schools. And so with that, uh, next slide. Um, I'll, I will uh, introduce Carlos de Valle. Again, he is the director, uh, executive director of the Department of Technology Services, and he'll provide an update on uh, the technology portion of BTA. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Jose, uh, Jose, uh, my name is Carlos de Valle, executive director of technology services for Seattle Public Schools. And I'll, I'll walk you through the, uh, uh, the portion of the BTA as far as technology uh, funding. Um, on this slide, uh, this slide of request pretty much paves the way for allocation of funds for sustainment of technology investments and effective uh, implementation of technical projects that we have uh, supporting high quality education for all students at um, Seattle Public Schools. Of note, 85% um, of uh, technology costs, um, it is funded by uh, these capital levy funds. Um, this includes at a high level staffing, uh, equipment, networks, uh, software, resources, licenses, just to name a few. And I'll go on a little bit uh, into detail uh, um, on the next slides. Uh, slide, please. Uh, this levy as um, aligns uh, fairly well with the guiding, uh, the board guiding principles that ensures uh, uh, students, educators, and the district uh, have the resources that they, they need um, for a high quality public education. Um, we have uh, three major areas within our technology uh, uh, budgeting that covers uh, the, the main buckets of, of our expenditures. And these are the uh, uh, listed right there, the student learning and support, district systems and data, and infrastructure security. Um, student learning and, and support covers uh, fundings uh, of the technical support staff uh, who provides the repairs and logistics uh, of equipment uh, at the schools. It also it pays for the digital learning support, uh, purchasing of our instructional software licenses, uh, buying students' laptops and tablets, and uh, the equipment for associated staff as well. Um, the district uh, systems and data, that one covers uh, uh, the software and systems developers and analysts, um, and the feed and care of uh, our business financial systems uh, are pretty much our day-to-day -day, uh, operational systems. Um, our learning uh, management systems as well, systems such as the uh, uh, Schoology and CSOC, and student information systems uh, that includes power schools. It also um, covers hardware and uh, software support licenses, uh, consultants and vendors uh, and associated contracts uh, that supports the students, uh, uh, these systems. Um, and, the and finally, the last one is the uh, infrastructure and security. That's our, our, our back end, you know, that drives the, the, the entire network. Uh, it provides um, funding for the operating costs of running the data centers, the, the backbone infrastructure, 
uh, cybersecurity money and systems, the uh, the server software licenses, and uh, pretty much all, all the operations equipment and hardware uh, maintenance, um, uh, sort of such a system, such a like security cameras of the schools is one of them. Um, they also pays for the internet connectivity of the past uh, year. We, we saw the, the need uh, for, you know, for hotspots. So this is where it comes from. Uh, and how do we provide for that connectivity? The telephone service for, for the entire district uh, and the associated staff that supports uh, that, um, that infrastructure. Next slide, please. So if you guys can see over the past year, we started about two years ago uh, doing the one-to-one -one and, and due, due to uh, the pandemic, uh, we were forced to, to, to accelerate that deployment. Um, which in turn, you know, we, we deployed one-to-one -one devices, laptops, tablets, uh, iPads, the hotspots, you name it. Um, and that um, that support nearly doubled the number of devices that, that we uh, need to manage uh, um, uh, for the whole enterprise, uh, which in turn uh, 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 increases our support and, and maintenance uh, as far as you know, technical support and, and, and the resources. Uh, to provide for that uh, increase in infrastructure to provide for all those devices. And that includes, you know, the student laptops, uh, uh, workstations at the school, uh, devices that we provided to staff when we went in remote uh, mode. Um, some of them still are in, the, in, in that mode. Um, so there's a lot of devices that, 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 that increase in our network uh, due to the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> how I said, this increase uh, uh, in devices, increase our infrastructure uh, and you know, every service that is tied up to that. Slide, please. So based on the guiding principles that, 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 that were provided, uh, we prioritize in technology investments closest to the students and educators and families with clear actions on um, inclusivity and usability and accessibility. Over the past year, we were building that infrastructure and now we're, we want to, to, to ensure that that is used correctly uh, and the tools that we will put forward um, it provides for for what the community the for the community feedback we have received and, and, and provide those solutions uh, to 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 follow on that. Uh, these equity tools and the learning support includes, the, for example, the curriculum software, the digital equity programs that we have put in place, um, easy use of uh, LMS uh, learning management systems uh, by educators um, and the educator tools and and other uh, support for. Um, English uh, English language learners learners put the systems you know that the, the translate and, and, and helps the community. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Richard. Um, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So, um, in the academics and athletics uh, funding portion of the BTA um, levies, um, each year we have special education program modifications that we need to make. Um, for the 7,000, approximately 7,500 students that Joe Lindbergh talked about in our special education program. We implement those um, facilities changes through a, a fund in the academics athletics. Um, we also have um, funding set aside for our synthetic turf replacement schedule. Um, generally, um, synthetic turf lasts approximately 10 years. Um, and so we have all of our synthetic turf on a replacement schedule. We have been um, since 2015 replacing the infill of the athletic fields uh, with cork in lieu of crumb rubber and uh, the BTA five um, capital levy will complete and we'll have um, all infills on all our, our synthetic uh, turfs will have uh, cork. Uh, in addition, as part of the bell time change for high schools that was implemented um, several years ago now, we made a commitment to install um, athletic field lights at our secondary schools. We've completed uh, the work at our high schools where we have athletic fields, and now we are implementing um, installation of uh, field lights at our middle schools. Um, in addition, we are funding um, some equipment for our athletic program, uh, equipment for our arts programs and science programs that are of a capital nature. So an example for a science classroom would be replacements of fume hoods. Examples for performing arts would be replacements of building stage 
curtains and then for athletic equipment, football sleds, things of that nature um, are uh, included in the athletic funding portion and the academic portion of, of the BTA 5 capital levy. Next slide. So in summary for our BTA 5 uh, capital levies is we will be making a recommendation um, to our school board of a levy that is $765 million um, to be collected over six years. Uh, it will address priority one projects. Uh, it ha will have a value of 46 cents per thousand of appraised value, um, which is a three cent increase um, over our BTA four capital levy in 2016. And again, I just wanna highlight that the district uh, in 2020 in response to the um, COVID pandemic went to one-to-one -to -one technology and a significant portion of that um, increase is related to um, technology um, to support the one-to-one -to -one, um, computer distribution um, for our students. So next slide. So next steps are uh, we're going to be having another um, levy meeting this week on Thursday. We'll be sharing questions and comments with our school board. Uh, we are anticipating that the school board will make a decision uh, concerning the levy on November 3rd of 2021. And then the levy will be placed before the voters uh, February 8th of 2022 to allow uh, the public to make a decision about um, the EPO and the BTA 5 capital levy. Next slide. And Tina, I think this is where I turn it back to you. That is correct. Hi again, everybody. We're going to move on now to our question and answer session. We'll unmute you when you're called on and you can st still put questions in the chat as we go along. Next slide, please. To raise your hand, if you don't know how, uh, click the hand button in your controls. And to get to the chat, you can use the icon button with a little circle around it um, next to the hand. We would like to focus on questions and comments about levy planning. Um, if you make comments, please limit yourself to less than two minutes to allow everyone the chance to speak or ask questions. Keep in mind that this is not the forum for public testimony to the school board. Please use our online Let's Talk feedback form to submit information you wish to share with the board or visit the school board web pages for board contact information. More information about the levies and the levy planning is posted on the web page. It will be updated as the district moves forward and the Let's Talk feedback link form, Let's Talk feedback form link can be found at the top of the page or in the right hand sub pages. So to get started, I don't, I see a, I see some hands raised. Um, let's see, Mike McDonald, I'm going to allow your mic and you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hi, yeah, thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I think from the last slide, I understood that content for the capital levies, for the next capital levy, uh, is decided by November. Um, is there a way to, or what do you recommend as a, I'm a new parent with SPS, how do you recommend I propose projects or influence the um, content, um, and and if if that, Deadline is looming. Is does that mean that any projects that I have in mind is sort of, are sort of pushed back another six years? Or sorry, any clarification would help. Thanks. So I'll take that um, question, Tina, and just note that um, Cap uh, Seattle Public Schools runs a capital levy every three years. Um, we do have a list of proposed projects that. Um, uh, we have um, that have been identified really through a third party consultant um, and some school board uh, priorities in conversations with the school board. 
I would say that we have a let, uh, let's talk feature that you could um, share your ideas, Mike, um, with the capital projects and planning. We can look at those ideas and then um, um, email back, you know, email back to your response. But we do have opportunities to provide feedback on our capital levies through let's talk. And Tina can provide more information. I think also the web link um, noted below on this last slide, um, you can provide feedback on as well. Now I'm going to call on Cynthia with your hand up. And you can unmute yourself. Cynthia Jattel. You're on mute if you can unmute yourself. OK, um, while we wait for Cynthia, there is a question in the chat that says uh, Megan asks, where can we find the list of the projects, specifically the priority one projects? Um, again, I'll take that question. I'll note. Uh, we made a uh, capital projects and planning made a presentation to the school board in August at a board work session um, as part of the documents that were submitted to the board to consider. We noted all of the projects. Um, it's a, about a 35 to 40 page document listing all of the priority one projects and the associated costs and what schools are being performed at. Um, you can go to that work session um, to look at that. Uh, in addition, we'll be updating the school board um, here next week, and we're providing that document again um, to the school board. So you'll have the opportunity to look at that um, September 29th. Uh, it'll be a document presented also on September 29th. We've made some minor revisions to the document we provided in August. Cynthia says she's unable to unmute. I'm going to try that again. Allow Mike. And Cynthia, can you unmute now? Because it shows that you can. Cynthia, could you put your question in the chat and then we will, um, because something seems to be not working on your end or on our end, but you're not unmuting. Tina, there looks like there's a question from Isaac for Richard. Um, who are the third party consultants, Richard, that recommended these projects? Um, third party consultants we utilized in 2020 uh, 20 were, was the Cezanne Environmental Group. Um, and we did have a um, facilities con uh, condition assessment done in 2014 as well. That was Ming analysis. Um, and we've um, really taken and combined those two reports. In addition, we had some work done in 2018 by McKinstry um, as well. And so we really utilized all three of these consultants and their recommendations to, uh, to Seattle Public Schools to formulate um, our BTA-5 levy ask. So we have another um, question in the chat. It says, can you speak to how and when equity considerations are part of the decision about what projects are selected and what ends up on the ballot? I believe that is also a question for Richard. Thank you, Tina. And I'm going to ask that Becky Asensio, who is our K-12 planning manager and helps formulate um, the levy um, asked for our BTA and our BEX levies um, address that question. Becky. Thank you, Richard. Um, 
Yes, we use a racial equity toolkit that our school district has put together um, that asks us questions as we work through data. Um, and we do that um, every time we are looking at data and trying to make decisions about what that data is telling us. Um, and then we also use uh, equity uh, analysis that's done by our uh, REA department research and evaluation. I can't remember their exact name uh, that they update every year that takes into account um, demographics, poverty, uh, and how well students do. Um, and that is a, uh, information that we also use to know which schools have higher needs. Um, so we use that throughout the whole planning process. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm going to um, come back to you in a minute, Mike. Um, I'm gonna read Cynthia's question because we couldn't unmute her. Cynthia would like to ask about the clean energy resolution that will require 1.3 billion to fully implement by 2040. How much of this levy is dedicated to implementation of the resolution in terms of decarbonization? So uh, I'll take that question, Tina, and I'll just note that, you know, I'm going to go back a little bit and say Seattle Public Schools is very um, much aware of um, our um, energy use and the impact that it has upon the environment. And I can proudly say our BEX4 schools um, are some of the highest performing schools in the state of Washington with energy use indexes in the teens to the low 20s. And the low 20s are really the landmark uh, historical buildings, our new facilities that are total replacements um, are down in the low teens. And if we had uh, solar arrays on those buildings, um, they would be considered uh, net zero buildings. Um, as uh, part of our BEX-5 capital levy, um, uh, we are implementing a replacement um, school at John Rogers Elementary School that will be a net zero uh, facility. We are currently in the selection of architects for that project. Uh, we will spend uh, two years designing that project um, and then two years constructing it and it will open in um, 2025 and will be um, Seattle Public Schools first net zero uh, school. I'll also note that um, with part of the clean energy resolution that was passed by the school board in February, uh, it um, discusses uh, the formate, formation of a task force um, and the, the task force is currently being um, formed at this moment in time with um, applications going to be uh, solicited in October for um, a November to, to begin meeting in November. One of the objectives of that task force will be to prioritize projects um, so that we get to um, net zero as a district by the year 2040 and that we are off of um, fossil fuels um, by the year 2040. Uh, we believe um, that this um, information is going to be critical to making good decisions as we move forward um, because we know that uh, some projects will be able to reduce carbon emissions um, faster than other projects and we want to be able to spend um, our resources where we will have the biggest impact um, and address the lowest hanging fruit um, uh, initially. And so we're looking forward to working with that task force to help guide us. We have included some seed money in our BTA-5 um, capital levy um, to begin implementing these clean energy projects. Um, uh, and, and approximately um, $1 million has been included and um, to address some of the task force, but we really look at the task force developing a list that's prioritized and then implementation beginning um, heavily in our BEX-6 capital levies. So hope that addresses the plan, but I will say um, 
Seattle Public Schools is very committed to reducing our carbon footprint. And this is something that we've been working on um, since 2014. Okay, okay, next, I'm going to go to Mike McDonald's question in the chat. He's asking about access to the reports from Meng Analysis and others, um, the reports that were done, the facilities master plan, I think is what he's looking for. Um, and I think that we will be posting that once it's been approved by the board, Richard. Um, I th if he's looking for us to post the um, recent Cezanne report, I'm not sure that we can make that um, ADA accessible. It's a rather large document. Um, the best way to pro would probably be to um, request a copy of that, and we can print a hard copy of that. If he's looking for that document, um, Tina. Mike, I believe that's the document you were looking for. We used to use Ming for it, um, and this year they use Cezanne. He says thank you. Um, any other questions? You can either raise your hand or put them in chat. Tina, we have a question from Melissa. Um, can you speak to how and when? Oh, we did that one, right? How and when equity considerations were part of it? Yes. Yeah, we did that one. All right, because I really like that question. <laughs> if we can answer it. <laughs> Is there any um, anything you want to say about that as relates to EPNO? Um, I just think that when we developed the equity tiering, it was about um, really thinking carefully about underrepresented students and those historical impacts on those students over time and trying to really focus on who are we serving in each building. So while some of it's about students living in poverty, it's also about um, students of color, students experiencing homelessness, students who are English language learners, all of those are really components that go into that equity uh, tier methodology. So I see we have a, another question. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tina. Um, it's a question about, could you please clarify where to find the list of recommended projects that was presented in August? Will the list be in the minutes and what was the date of the meeting? Um, I am currently looking for the link to that and uh, we'll post it. It is in the board work session for August 11th, Richard, is that correct? Yep, August 11th. And it was one of the two documents. We had a high level summary document and then we provided um, the specific projects that made up that high level summary document as well. So that you should see um, two documents. You can go to the uh, board work session and you're able to access those documents. I did that just literally less than a week ago. So I know it's up there on our web. And I, I'm looking for that link and I'll put it here in the chat. And then I will note, we'll also be providing an updated document to the board at the September 29th work session. So Tina, you're looking for the link. We're look, um, other questions or, from, or comments from those attending? I see one that says, where do after school programs fit into the levies? It's a sincere need for many elementary school families. And before you answer that, um, I just put the link that goes directly to the board materials for August 11th. And if you click on the meeting agenda, it will download all of the materials that were shared at that meeting or the materials that were part of that meeting. So now we'll go back to where do after school programs fit into the levies? Yeah, so um, Megan, thank you for that question. So really how after school programs, they're not funded by the levies typically. So typically if we have high poverty schools, many of them will fund after school or before school programs out of their federal title one dollars or maybe their state dollars that are similar. So they have the ability if, if they receive dollars from the city's levy, um, they're often funding after school programs. 
if they receive some federal or state grant dollars, they're often funding um, after school programs. So that is typically how um, those are funded. And I'm going to jump in and just also um, say from a facility standpoint, what we do is we um, design both our um, multi-purpose rooms and our gymnasiums such that they can be used by um, after school groups. Um, we do uh, put a small uh, kitchenette area in the uh, multi-purpose room that um, you know snacks can be served on it after school, um, includes a refrigerator, um, sink. Um, so we do make provisions in all of our um, elementary schools, um, our new elementary schools and our modernized schools to meet the needs of our after school programs. Other questions? Um, Melissa pointed out that the um, board agenda for the work session has very long amount of attachments um, and the BTA levy was part two. So the um, list of projects is at the very end, the last several pages. Anything else? I think that we just want to tell everyone how much we appreciated them joining us tonight. Um, Carlos and Richard as other presenters, if you want to express your gratitudes as well, thank you for coming out. We know that um, it takes time in your schedule to make this a priority and we appreciate that and we appreciate uh, you supporting Seattle Public Schools by coming and ask us, asking these questions. And I'll uh, echo that comment, Jolyn, and then I'll just say we are having another um, meeting on Thursday of this week as well uh, for the public to take, uh, you know, additional public uh, input. And so um, with um, an opportunity to ask questions. So. But again, as Jolyn said, uh, we do appreciate um, your feedback. Let me just finalize that by saying, you know, that there's um, there's been a huge increase in the past on, on this technology, uh, trying to support everybody, and um, it will be, you know, um, amazing for you know the, the, to bring this this uh, technology and, and how we increase uh, um, education and, and make it better. Uh, it is very important. Uh, it is a big portion of this levy, and I appreciate uh, you guys' support. Thank you. I am going to put the direct link to the feedback form into the chat, but you can also find it on that levy information page. Um, and uh, there's a message here from Melissa Palethorpe, who is with Schools First, soliciting help. If you guys are interested, please contact them. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting now.